the second episode of my podcast, How to Become a Pro Wedding Photographer. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more valuable content. Today, I'm going to start with some tips and how to choose the right camera. Perhaps the most difficult decision you have to take at the beginning. Now, I often receive messages from you guys asking what camera should you buy or if it's the right time to switch from this DSLR to mirrorless. I always reply with these specific questions. What kind of pictures you want to take and what budget you plan to allocate for that? In more than 80% of the cases, the budget is less than 500 euros. In reality, that translates into a hobby equipment and not a professional one. My first DSLR was a Nikon D90 with two 18-55mm and 50f 1.8 lenses. See pictures and link here. I've used them for almost two years. Enough time for me to master the basics of photography. I cannot recommend buying the best performing cameras as long as you don't know how to work with them. Learning the principles behind the photography first will help you manage better in the future. The entry-level cameras nowadays are not like 10 years before, right? So it's not about Canon or um, Nikon or Sony. The D-series from both Nikon and Canon are perfect for any beginner. Even if they're cheaper, variable aperture lenses will make your life a hell. Ever since I started working in photography, I had only one such lens, 18-55mm after which I didn't want to hear about it ever again. Fixed aperture lenses are more robust build, right? So brighter and with much better results than variable aperture lenses. You need to understand and learn how each feature works in order to decide which is the best camera for you. Every photographer needs different lenses depending on his needs and style of taking pictures. For example, as a wedding photographer, on the day of the event, I've noticed that the most used lenses are 14, 24 millimeters, a wide, uh, 35 millimeters and 85 millimeters, a telephoto. Even if I use the other lenses I have in my bag over 16% of the time, these three lenses are mounted on my devices. And that's because of my style, a photojournalistic style in which I combine relaxed moments with those of total madness. Every photographer has its own style. I never loved 50 millimeters. Others do not remove it from the device. These are personal decisions based on every photographer's experience and style. I recommend that you test as many focal lengths as possible. Take them to the event or the photo shoot and use them when you think you need them. Then, after downloading the photos on your computer, check how many of them you took with each lens and which are the most beloved images. After that, you can make the decision, you can take the decision to buy them or not. If out of 1000 photos you have only 10 frames with 7200 millimeters, a 2000 euro lens, and the images are just to be there, this is definitely not the time to buy it. At the beginning, there is a strong desire to have as much as you can get, right? As many lenses in the bag as possible. I know I was in your place. I had a period of time when I couldn't stop buying lenses and I was just reinvesting all my money I was earning without thinking how much a certain feature would help me. Be modest with your investment and make sure you make the right choice every time. Wildlife photographers will need other lenses than the event type ones, right? The, um, wedding photographers, the christening photographers, and so on. You'll never enter the church with 500 millimeters on your shoulder, ready to throw grenades left and right, right? It's a big lens. Those who photograph products will also need to have a macro lens for details. The discussion with ISO 
is quite complex and yet so simple. What kind of ISO should the camera have when you buy it? Well, the brighter the lens, the less attention you'll pay um, to which ISO you're shooting. A 1.4 aperture in a dark location saves you from raising the ISO above 1600, while an aperture above 4 will force you to raise it even above 4000 where there is not enough light. Personally, I had only one event that I photographed um, entirely in ISO 10,000, by mistake. Otherwise, I think I can count on the fingers of both hands, left and right, the number of times I raise it over 2000, 2000, yeah, that's right. Even if, if you take uh, night photos without auxiliary light sources, then ISO comes into play. In 2020, I still believe that a decent ISO 3000 is enough for any circumstance at an event. I believe that you don't photograph events only in the woods or in the caves, right? So I think it's a mistake to buy a camera only because it has an extra feature which you think maybe, maybe it might get handy one day. When we all know it's just a hypothetical case, again, pay attention to what investments you make for um, your equipment and how much they lose value over time. In this episode of uh, my podcast, we only talk about minimum investments you have to make to, in order to be able to start your way in photography. In addition to a body and lenses, you will also need cards, SD cards, CF cards, and so on, and external flash, and a computer for image processing. Cards are extremely important for any photographer. As time goes by, you'll see that they will be very helpful in difficult times or actually get quite confusing when you expect the least. Why? because of the right speed and quality. So if you want to become an event photographer, you need fast cards, which can write in difficult conditions at least a burst of three, four photos per second. What have I used so far and been very happy with? Mm, SanDisk and Lexar cards. They're the best you can have, in my opinion, right? Make sure the number written on them you have a, a number on every card, is the real one. There are cards labeled 90 megabytes, right? When actually the writing speed is 40 megabytes. Always read the details and reviews before buying. This is available for any products you buy, even for your dishwasher. <laughs> if you can buy the rest of equipment secondhand, then the cards should be sacred for you and you can only buy them for official stores. Yeah, don't risk it. An external flash is the secret weapon of any photographer. Even those who say that they don't use artificial light, they do have such a device in their luggage. Yeah. Uh, this device can get them out of difficult situations. And when it's not a flash, it's a video lamp. In our days, the trend is more a photojournalistic one. And you want to capture the surprised expression of a guest or go to a location where the party is outdoors, for example. And the only light is the one coming from the band stage and from the stars. Even if your style is one without artificial light, you will have an advantage in your sleeve to be able to handle any circumstance. For starters, I recommend the cheapest flashes, but remember, um, they have to be like 180 uh, degrees able to rotate, so you can direct the light in any direction you want and um, carry TTL support a topic we will discuss in the next episode. Because so many producers have appeared in recent years popping up like mushrooms, the prices have dropped. Now you can buy a used flash for 50 euros. I bought mine for 300, 400 a piece. 
and because you can't go to an event with your shopping bag, you'll need a photo bag or a backpack. I just think my first camera bag was about 10 euros and I could put in an extra body, an extra lens and the battery charger. Speaking of batteries, I recommend that you buy another spare in the beginning. Even if you think it's enough to cover your entire event, temperature differences can cause the batteries to suddenly discharge. Even the location of the camera next to certain devices that influence magnetically. Physics rules apply every time, remember this. Holding your device around your neck doesn't help you with a professional look. And even more, it seriously affects your spine and your posture. Instead, you could use um, some straps, right? Or a hand strap, a spider holder, or just hold it on your shoulder. If you also have the flash mounted on the camera, you should bite a little bit of it each time you hold it by the neck. To get the photos from the event on your computer, you first need a card reader. I recommend that you have a card reader even if your laptop or PC is already uh, equipped with this kind of reader for the simple and ridiculous reason that by inserting the card directly into the unit, at first you can forget it in there. You can hit it unintentionally and destroy it. Not to mention that it's not a very good idea to leave the card in the PC or in the laptop yeah, for a long time. And it's also about speed. If not made to order, most likely the speed of the computer reader will not compete with one that is a professional card reader. I've always appreciated Lexal readers and I haven't had any problems with them in six years, say, if you do not have a CF cards but intend to buy a device that has such a slot in the future, I recommend you that you will buy a card reader directly that also covers the CF area. To complete the shopping list, you should buy a computer and a monitor for editing. And you should buy a color calibrator also for the monitor. Okay, you can rent it or you can call people who do those kind of calibration at home. Having a master computer and a 50 euro display is like putting the most expensive diesel fuel in your car but shifting gears in low revs. A good monitor with over 90% calibrated as RGB will help you edit correctly for your customers and for those whom you send pictures to print it. For almost two years my photos didn't look as close as they should have because I have editing them on a laptop worth, I don't know, around 500 euros. Let's talk a little bit about another frequent question. What should I buy? A laptop or a PC for my photo editing? From the very beginning, you need to keep in mind that Lightroom needs a powerful processor and a fast SSD. Because at first I was editing photos directly in JPEG format, I didn't need a powerful unit. When I made the switch to editing RAWs, I had to make a considerable upgrade by default. Even if there are ways to use fewer resources when working with RAWs, we'll talk about editing in a future episode, you'll still need power when uploading and exporting them. Not to mention the moments when you use the brush, the magical brush in Lightroom. In 2014, I decided to get a MacBook because I needed a laptop which I could take with me everywhere as I travel quite often to different parts of the country or abroad because I was used to working even when I wasn't at home. The idea of having a laptop suited me more. That's how it was. The 15 inch MacBook from 2013 was what I needed. And in the meantime, I realized that I can finish work directly at the studio and that I can enjoy more departures if I don't edit on my laptop as well. So I invested in a workstation. In 2016, I was in a big dilemma when I had to choose between iMac and PC. After testing the display from Apple Thunderbolt 27 inch, I realized that at the time, it was too big for my eyes. My head was hurting nonstop. Yeah, for seven days, my head was just hurting, blowing. I returned it. 
and I decided that instead of investing 4,000 euros in the top product at that time from Apple, I would buy a PC and monitor with even high performances than 2,000 euro. Even now, I don't regret the decision I've made and it's strictly everyone's choice. But for a photographer at the beginning of the road who does not have a budget of 3,000 or 30,000 euros for the entire professional equipment, it is the right decision. I used the following configuration for many years. An i7 processor at 4 GHz and 32 RAM, a 6 GB video card and 2 Tera SSD. One for the operating system and one for the folders and for the materials I edit. You could ask me the following. Okay, but can't I buy a PC or MacBook from 2014 now? and to edit as fast as you could six years ago? No, the aging of the components makes a big mark on them with each passing year. Even if you used the same programs, the same photos you used six years ago, the performance and speed would not be the same. Otherwise, the producer would not sell anything new. This is consumerism. The 25 inch Dell monitor was right for the start. With at least 90% as RGB, it allowed me to edit and see the colors close to perfection. And the surprises between what I saw at home and the albums I received from the print stopped. Last year, I upgraded to a 27 inch BenQ and I'm glad that my eyes are also happy and my head doesn't hurt anymore. So if you're on the go all the time, a MacBook would be the best option. Why not a laptop for 500 or 600 euros? Because the display will be an embarrassment. Just to replace the display of a MacBook Pro costs you 800 euros. Could a laptop of 7 or 800 euros have an Apple-like display? I'm not sponsored by Apple, but the answer would still be no. So for my studio, I would choose a PC for photographers that travel a lot, a MacBook. Neither the PC or the MacBook can be from 2012, for example. I think that an i7 processor after 2016 will be a good starting point. With all these things checked, you are ready to move on the next step. Thank you for watching the second episode of the How to Become a Pro Wedding Photographer podcast. See you next time and don't forget, more than photography, passion.